This week we're talking about VDI best practices with Zen Desktop. Exciting, fun stuff. I just want to start off by saying that I don't like the word best practices at all, and I want to define some best practices. Uh, best practices are loosely defined by the vendor stack that you have, right? Because best practices in your environment is not going to be the same as best practices in your environment, right? So when we use best practices, we're just using them in terms of what the vendor says, that they're best practices for a particular product, right? And I just want to give an example, because I'm not going to use the term best practices anymore, because I don't like it. And so what I really want to talk about is uh, lessons learned. For the past four years, we've been doing a lot of uh, desktop deployment. And what I really want to share is the lessons learned of the past four years of doing these type of deployments. That's what we're really going to talk about today. So if you're going through a VDI deployment, you do want to look at your vendor stack and who you're going to use and look at specifically their best practice if you're going to use it for a VDI deployment, right? All right, so why desktop virtualization? So how many people in the room are doing desktop virtualization? I've already started it, thinking about it. All right, we got a couple, a couple people planning on it. All right, so the whole idea of desktop virtualization is I need to give people a, an operating environment to run their application, right? I mean, you got to think, what is my goal as an IT person? And my goal as an IT person is to give people some applications so they can do their job. I mean, I just dare you to turn off the mail server for a day and see what happens, right? So Outlook, Word, whatever medical billing system is being used whatever financial application package is being used, whatever CRM, my job is to give you the applications that you need. So the desktop is really my mechanism to deliver those applications to you in a nice package that you're used to using. You can log on to that desktop, launch your applications, and use them as you wish, right? So I often get asked a question, why would you do desktop virtualization over using like traditional Zen app, server-based applications? And so really the difference is, depending on your application set, you can get those applications deployed easily on a desktop virtualization as opposed to Zen app, like some applications that don't play well together, they won't install together. Some vendors will just tell you outright, I don't, I don't support it on a terminal server, right? Like I'll just give you an example, GTC, we're just a small company, 50 people, we're not huge. Uh, we have two applications that we can't run in Zen app. Two applications that we use, we can't run them in Zen app. We tried, even with third-party tools and things like that. So uh, we deploy virtual desktops, and with those virtual desktops, we can deploy the two applications that we really need to use. The vendors support them, and life is good. So why desktop virtualization? Well, i got to give people their, their applications. Okay. So I love this marketing slide because what we're going to do here is we're just going to take the desktop, and we're just going to move it into the data center. Right? Really easy, really awesome, right? So the salespeople are going to come along, and they're going to tell you how awesome virtual desktops are, and we're just going to stick them in the data center, and they're going to sell you a bunch of licenses, and then me and my team, we're going to show up and help you deploy the desktop into the infrastructure. Only when I get there, this is what I'm looking at. This is your environment, right? I mean, all of you. So now I have to talk to you, and I'm just going to make that other picture in the past fit into this environment. So what do I need to talk to? I need to talk to the storage guy. I got to talk to the network guy. I got to talk to the guy who runs the VMware or the Zen server, who does the hardware. Because desktop virtualization is very invasive through all the technologies in your data center. You're suddenly dependent upon your infrastructure in your data center to provide desktops that before were a different division, a different group of people with different processes and procedures. If uh, something went wrong with one person's desktop, that one person was affected. If something goes wrong now, a lot of people are affected, right? When we move our desktop into our data center. So everything that we do at TTC, we follow this project methodology, plan, build, and manage, right? The first thing that we always do is we've got to figure out a plan. What is it that we're trying to accomplish? What are we going to do? Then we need to build it. We actually got to do the install of whatever it is that we're doing, and then we have to manage it after it's been deployed. And believe it or not, that's usually the hard part, is to manage after it's been deployed. So I just want to talk about briefly a couple of things that we've learned in each phase, plan, build, and manage, as you go through your own desktop virtualization, whatever phase you're in, 
if you're just in the planning part, or if you've already started, or you're in the managed part, I'm just going to talk about some of the things that we've learned in each of those sections. All right, so planning. So you're planning out your VDI deployment. What are really your objectives of the VDI deployment? What is it that you're trying to solve? You know, I get into so many meetings and I have a conflict of the people sitting in the room of what they think VDI is going to do for them, right? So believe it or not, just internally with your team, define what it is that you want to do with the VDI solution. Make sure you have that well defined so you can set yourself up for success, right? You want to have a success criteria of what the VDI solution is going to do. You want to assess the current environment, know what applications you're supporting, know what your users are really doing with those desktops. Um, you want to do a POC, definitely do a POC. You can test your peripherals, you can test different applications, right? This is all part of that planning. Uh, you want to do a design to make sure that you understand all the components that are going to be necessary to do the deployment. And then other projects that are running at the same time of your VDI deployment. We've had to pause a couple of projects just recently because they were upgrading their network or moving to a new data center. You know, there's other variables going on in your data center while you're trying to do a VDI deployment that will make it more or less difficult to do that deployment if you're moving things around on the back end, right? All right, so just again, when you're moving your desktops into the data center, right, there's a lot of things you want to think about the server hardware you're using, which hypervisor are you going to choose. You know, you might be standardized on one but decide to use another or change a hypervisor which would require different skills if you decide to go with a different hypervisor than what you may already have. Uh, storage, you're going to, that's going to be the heart of your VDI deployment, what type of storage you have on the back, how many IOPS you're going to, are you going to use existing storage, you're going to buy new storage, uh, internet and bandwidth considerations. Do you have enough bandwidth available to support uh, multiple users? And then, of course, applications. And are your applications going to work in a VDI environment? Are you going to go to 64-bit, 32-bit? Are your applications going to work uh, on the platform you want to deploy? All right. So some of the things that just stand out that are best practice for every situation that we've seen so far, right? is make sure that you disable power settings on your host because they're not disabled by default. If you go into your host, especially HP, you have power saving features that are on. And so the HP servers will say, oh, I'm not really busy, so I'm going to start shutting some things down. I'm going to reduce CPU speed, right? And then everyone wants to log in and start working, and now all those uh, cycles are low and things are really slow, and it takes a while to come up. So one of the things that you want to do on your deployment is make sure you disable power saving features on the host. Is the hypervisor supposed to wake it up? It is supposed to wake it up. And it will wake it up, but your users will not have a good experience during that time of wake up. Yes, the question was, will the hypervisor wake it up? And the answer is yes, it will. It'll just be slow to respond for the users while it's going through that process. All right, so VDI workloads, you want to enable hyper-threading on your host, right? This is, uh, this works well for VDI workloads, uh, but not necessarily all of your workloads. Like one of the things you want to make sure that you do is you keep your VDI workload separate in a separate cluster as you do with your server workloads. Your VDI should be on their own cluster and their own workload so you can do these modifications these optimizations that are not necessarily applicable to your exchange server and your SQL server. So you don't want to mix those together in the same host or the same cluster. <clears throat> okay, so depending on um, the storage that you have, right, each vendor has a specific way that they would like you to configure their storage for a VDI workload. All right, and we're going to spend some time on storage at the end of this because it's really important. It becomes the most important component of your virtual desktop infrastructure. Uh, but just know whatever type of storage that you're using, uh, the vendor has a specific way they want you to configure it for a VDI workload. Okay, some of the other things that are just standard that you want to do for every VDI deployment pretty much. Now you want to create a uh, virtual desktop VLAN. 
is separated in your network just for your virtual desktop so it's not sharing the VLAN of your servers or or other workloads running. Uh, DHCP scope for that VLAN so they can get IP addresses. Uh, verify DNS redundancy and DNS dynamic update. You want to verify because everything in a Zen desktop environment between the VDA, the virtual desktop agents installed on the virtual machines and the broker, you know, what communicates the connection to the user, everything is dependent upon DNS. So they do forward and reverse lookups when they're talking to each other, registering the VMs with the broker. So you really want to make sure that DNS is highly available and redundant because if a DNS server becomes unavailable, your desktops will not be able to register and therefore your desktops will become unavailable. So DNS is a huge piece of a VDI deployment. And that kind of goes back to the, what I said before in the beginning on the planning and kind of maybe remediating some things in your environment or looking to make sure some things are healthy prior to the implementation. Because I got to tell you, you know, we're the escalation, uh, we're the escalation support desk to the world, right? <laughs> As Labo would say. So when you guys call us, when you guys call us, I mean, you guys are all smart, right? You guys have all been working and you've already started troubleshooting the problem. So when it hits our support desk, we know that you guys have a serious problem, right? So uh, that's where I got most of these from, by the way. Some of these best practices, lessons that we've learned, I'm sharing for some of the calls that just hit our, our support desk that we see a lot. And so we know, we know when you guys are calling it serious. Yes, sir. So Ashton. If you have integrated DNS and AD, it's less of any of two, two domain control, uh, you don't see it. Correct? Yeah, so the question is, if you have two Active Directory controllers that also run DNS and they're integrated, do you see the issue? So the answer is yes, we still see that issue. And I'll tell you why we've seen the issue recently when we got the call. Because the replication was broken between the two domain controllers, and they didn't know. Right, because you know, AD replicates itself, and DNS replicates itself. Well, in this particular environment, the primary domain controller went down. The Netscaler was pointing LDAP to the primary domain controller. And the synchronization never occurred, and they didn't know. Just when that domain controller went offline, they were done. So that's why you want to verify those type of things as part of your planning and part of your ongoing maintenance. You know, AD replication and DNS replication is pretty critical. All right, so antivirus exclusions. Like this one is huge. You know, this is we've seen VDI deployments fail because of antivirus, the wrong antivirus. HBSS, McAfee, HBSS. Anybody? Anybody? It won't work with provisioning server and a VDI deployment. So it, whatever policy that you have in place right now, you're going to have a different policy in place for your virtual desktop, right? Whatever exclusions you're going to make and the frequency of the updates and how often it's querying, that's all going to change. And we see this happen a lot. In the beginning, when you do the design and you do the deployment, everything will be working great. All the exclusions were done. But somehow, that policy with the regular desktops and the virtual desktop over time, we see that suddenly it's not configured correctly. And the, they get, we get the call. Hey, the VDI environment's running really slow all of a sudden. We don't know what's going on. We have these random slowdowns. And then what we usually find is antivirus was turned on, and they're all running scans at the same time, or they're all downloading at the same time, the, the signature file. Um, the SSL certificate on your Netscaler, when's it going to expire? Do you know when it's going to expire? And do you have another one readily available? Because we get a, hey, no one can log in. Oh, no one can log in. We start troubleshooting. Oh, the certificate's expired on the Netscaler. All right? So we find that. Or the anti-spam Yes. <laughs> yes, thank you, Keith. Uh, provisioning server, right? As we said before, we want to take our server workloads and have them on separate servers in a separate cluster, right? That's where we want our server workloads to run, and we want to have our VDI running in a different cluster, right? So what we'll find is the provisioning server will be on a different VLAN, on a different cluster, and it's streaming, right? Provisioning server streams the OS across the network down to the host, right? And so we find any time that we've seen it, the network guys and the VDI guys, they're talking to each other, trying to figure out what's happening. As soon as we move that workload onto the same VLAN as the uh, virtual desktop, things are great. The only, the only 
the exception I would make to mix my server workload and my VDI workload on the same host would be the provisioning server. The provisioning server close to the virtual desktop streaming that OS uh, give you the best performance. So you want definitely to be on the same VLAN as the VDI session. Can that be, can that be virtualized? Can that be virtualized? The provisioning server? Yes, the provisioning server can be virtualized. And uh, we recommend it, actually. Best way to, it's the best way to do it. OK, streaming applications. Streaming applications, it's an ongoing discussion. And if you're streaming applications, the one thing that you have to know is you're going to have to increase the size of your write cache that you're assigning to your virtual desktop. Right? You have write cache that you're going to assign or personal VDisk. Because that takes space, you know. So you know what it's like to package. Uh, you know what application virtualization is, right? You package an application, you put it in its own isolation environment, you stream it down from a file share, basically down to the operating system, and it doesn't make any changes to the registry or the file system, right? That's the whole purpose of application virtualization. I stream it down, and I don't modify the operating system uh, registry or or file system. And it works. App V works really well. I saw it with my own eyes. It did really work. But the write cache was severely uh, undersized, right? Because that's where it goes. When I'm streaming applications and you get five or six, if you stream Office, your write cache now goes up and the IOPS on your SAN now goes up, right? So just keep that in mind if you're planning application virtualization or streaming virtual uh, applications to a virtual desktop. Or Zen app. All right. So security. The security on a virtual desktop is the same as the security on your physical desktop. You want to take the same precautions and procedures that you do right now with your physical desktop. You want to keep them up to date. Keep the antivirus up to date. Make sure the users aren't doing things they shouldn't be doing to compromise that operating system. Just make sure you put. The, yes, sir. Yeah, you mentioned. Uh, don't use certain type of antivirus, right? You're just joking, or, or pay attention to how it's configured for the. Uh... Yeah. So the question is, um, the question is, how do I? What antivirus uh, should I use, or is there some antivirus that I shouldn't use? So the answer is, yes, there is some antivirus that is more intrusive on the operating system than other antivirus solutions. So whatever that you're using. Uh, you just want to make sure that you get the exclusions in place, get the exclusions in place, and make sure you know the vendor's best practices for that antivirus in a virtual desktop. Yep. So when uh, that is an excellent point. So. The question is, when we start to do our design and we do our initial consultation, do we bring in the security team that does the current uh, uh, workstations and how they do the antivirus? Because the team that we're talking to usually doesn't do that. And the answer is yes. We need those people because they're the ones who are going to create the exclusions for us and set the update frequency and things like that. And why everyone is asking me why I'm repeating the question is because we have a lot of people on the webinar. Everyone was looking at me funny, like, why is he repeating the question? <laughs> that's not the reason. Oh, that's not, why is my hair okay? <laughs> All right, so we do the plan, we do the design, we do the implementation, right? And we make it through, we talk to everyone we need to, and now we need to manage it. This ongoing process, ongoing operations and management, right? So this is really critical because, you know, in the past four years, I can't tell you how many VDI deployments we've done, and this is our challenge, and this is what my support desk starts ringing, right? So what happens is we walk away. We come in, we did the design, we did the deployment, and we send people to training. Bruce, Bruce Payne, Batman over there, man, he comes in, he teaches everyone how to be Citrix administrators. We get everyone dialed in, and uh, we still, you know, receive those calls occasionally. Um, one of the things that we want to point out for the management of the virtualization is this tool that we've recently fell in love with, and it's recently saved me on a few VDI deployments, is uh, EG Innovation, right? Because you probably have some monitoring tools in place. You're monitoring your infrastructure. Maybe you're 
your servers, your VMware, you're using VOPS or VTOPS or whatever they call that is. Well, this particular software monitors both the Citrix component, provisioning server, your brokers, your virtual desktop infrastructure itself, as well as the underlying infrastructure, regardless of what your hypervisor, if it's VMware, Hyper-V, and the storage on the back end. So it's basically an SNMP monitoring, like your traditional one. But what it gives you the ability to do is when it's running and you have a problem, again, I now have maybe 150 virtual desktops running on one blade in my data center. All right? And so now when I have a problem, not if just one person on this PC is not having the problem, I'm now having a problem with 150 PCs. This just happened yesterday morning, and I got the call yesterday morning. So basically what this tool does, it gives us the ability to quickly identify where the problem is to get it resolved. You know, I don't have to scramble around. Is it a VMware problem? Is it a storage problem? Is it a statistics problem? It basically gives you some insight into the whole thing. It's called EG Innovations. Mm -hmm. I've installed it like three, three times now where we've got the call. Uh, hey, man, we're having this weird problem, a performance problem. We can't figure it out. And I've installed it three different places, in a, and we've been able to identify the problem and get it resolved. So I'm, I'm really happy with it at this point. I hope I don't change my mind ever. Really. I'm going too fast? Okay. Oh, we do? Okay, cool, man. The Citrix monitoring tools that come with Zen Desktop, don't they do that, help you identify the issues? Yes, they do. So like the uh, in the Desktop Studio, I'll repeat, thank you, thank you, Asha. Yeah, so doesn't the Citrix uh, tools, don't they come with some monitoring? Um, components and the answer is yes yes they do there's a uh, desktop director that you can log into and look at the performance of everything and in the desktop studio itself you can see if your hosts are okay if your storage is okay it does give you a snapshot of that is there something related to like why is it that the sort of edge side by itself you know why do you need a tool like this when you have um, Citrix, okay, so the question is, why would I need this tool instead of Citrix Edge Site? Or to add to it? Because Citrix Edge Site doesn't work very well. All right? Citrix doesn't even want to use it. They're not doing any development on it anymore. And don't use it, especially in a VDA environment. I'm just saying. That's why. I mean, it had it had its place, uh, but it's never worked as as promised. That's why. Okay, so once we get everything deployed, you need to come and let Bruce get you all trained up, so you can manage it. And this is Citrix. Uh, Citrix. This comes straight from Citrix Consulting Services of how many people that you need and what level of skills that they need to manage this environment after we've done the design and stood it up and put it in place, right? So if you got less than 100 servers or less than 3,000 users, you're recommending one CCA on your help desk, one to two CCEEs, right? These are enterprise uh, engineers. I've lost track. Uh, and uh, CCIA, which is an infrastructure architect. So these are basically different levels of skills that Citrix has defined of you know, what you need to manage this environment once it's stood up, right? And so this kind of just lists out the skill sets. Like this is your help desk. So you're going to have people on the help desk now who used to take those uh, workstation calls. You know, my computer froze or whatever. They're not doing computers, not going to people's computers anymore. They're dealing in the infrastructure of the data center now. So these are the skills that they need to have to address the, be helpful, to the user and the uh, data center administrators. And this is uh, the highest level, the CCIA, which is really what we do, right? This is what GTC does. We come and we do the design, we do the deployment, and then we turn it over for the administration. Okay, so what's next, right? So we went through the process, we reviewed our environment, we identified why we wanna do VDI. Everyone agrees with it in the whole organization of what it's gonna achieve. Uh, we've identified what we need to deploy it. We did the deployment. We got everybody trained. We have the skills. And uh, things are going well, right? 
But that's where we're at in our in our ideal world right now. Everything's going great. So now what we're going to do? We're going to expand, right? So okay, we had a good successful uh, implementation. The whole accounting department's been moved over, or Q and A's been moved over, and we've had some success. And so now we're going to expand, right? So the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge of expanding a VDI deployment is IOP. Okay. When you want to start deploying, and we're talking past like a couple hundred users, when you want to start deploying past that couple hundred users, our biggest obstacle is IOP on the SAN. And during that time, if we decided to use the existing SAN or the existing infrastructure, you know, you're going to have to buy more disk, right? You're going to have to provide the IOPS to expand this VDI. So before, on your workstations, you never really thought about IOPS, right? It's not a metric that we ever cared about on a workstation, right? We thought about memory and CPU and network connectivity in our standard workstations. We never really thought about the IOP on the disk. So you know that a typical SATA drive on a desktop or a laptop is about 150 IOPS. Think about just on your laptop, right, or on your desktop. And some people, like, have the SSD drives, you know, like, I want an SSD drive. Now they have 5,000 IOPS available to them to their disk, right? So this is just what you have local. Uh, if you were going to make that same performance available in a virtual desktop environment, you would have to provide a lot of IOPS, right? A lot of IOPS in order to get the same performance you would on a standard uh, VDI desktop, on a standard workstation. So right now what's been happening is as people start to expand and the way that the VDI vendors, and this includes VMware, this includes Citrix, the way that they've been defining how many IOPS you need is 20 to 25 IOPS per user, right? That's what they recommend. That, that's what they're suggesting, because they're saying that not all users are going to use the same amount of IOPS at the same time. So you just schedule 20 to 25 IOPS per user, right? And you might get away with that at first with a few people, the receptionists, and a couple people. But as you get some power users on there who really start using IOPS, you know you're going to start having a problem. So if you look at a, a typical server, and if you just load it up with SAS drives, you know, you're going to get 1,600 IOPS in the best case local on that server, right? So if you get 150 users on there like we target, right, it's usually between 80 and 150 users per host, however many hosts you have, right? So you're basically going to drop down to about 10 IOPS per desktop, and things are really going to slow down, and people are going to notice. People are going to notice it. So really, this is expanding your VDI. Is there any questions? I want to make sure because this is really becomes the bottleneck for expanding a VDI session. Yes, sir. So the numbers that Citrix and VMware employ are saying we're understating those IOPS they recommend. Or I'm saying that that is the IOPS that they are recommending. Or when when you go to do the sizing and all their sizing calculators, they basically have 20 to 25 IOPS per VM. So, you know, again, going back to a traditional workstation or a laptop where you have 150 and you start breaking it down because you don't think everyone's going to use them at the same time, but then we've seen it. We've seen people just add another 100 VMs to their VDI and this everything comes to a crawl because the SAN is now not keeping up with the number of IOPS needed. Okay, so, so this is the expansion of the VDI. So we have uh, really three ways, three things that we can do to address this issue for expanding our virtual desktops, right? Again, you know, if you're just deploying a couple hundred desktops, 300 desktops, you know, and you're not expanding past that, you're not going to have the problem. Because when you start expanding past those 300, 400 desktops, you start bringing in more people, that's when you're really going to see the, uh, the IOPS slow down on your, on your storage. Okay, so we have SSD drives. We have micropods, and we have software. I think you guys were here last week. Was it Atlantis, Elio? They were here last week? Some people were not. Okay. The week before. The week before. Thank you, Keith. Go back to Atlantis, and each one of them, what is the That's a great idea. So the first one that we have is uh, called Whiptail. <laughs> Whiptail is SSD drives. It's an SSD array, right? 
Uh, we have run. We have one running. It's a Whiptail. It's just a small one. Again, we're a small company, right? But they gave it to me. So how could I resist? But it's one and a half terabytes SSD drives. I run it. All of our virtual desktops get about 5,000 IAMPs per user. So it's pretty quick, pretty nice. Um, and the way that they do it is they just stack the they just stack the arrays together. And as you stack another, it's just all SSD based flash drives. You just stack them on, you just put them together, and you just keep adding IOPS into the rack as you need it. Because remember, it's not so much space that we're trying to get. Right? Traditionally, on my EMC, my NetApp, with my SAS based drives, I got to add another drive, and that another drive is going to give me another 200 IOPS if I'm lucky, right? Another 200 IOPS for every drive that I put in minus whatever RAID penalty I take, right? So basically, as I add these drives, I can get a significant amount of IOPS to continue the expansion of my VDI deployment. That's one way to do it, SSD storage arrays. Uh, the second way to do it is called Micropod. And this Micropod technology is really old school. I call it the old school way of doing it, right? You just get a server like you used to. You put a bunch of drives in it, and with the array controller, and the, you tweak the array controller, and you provide uh, eight to ten thousand IOPS just for a standard one U server that you can stick in the rack, right? So I, I want to back one second because I missed something, and it's the right cache. You guys are familiar with provisioning server and the way that the virtual desktops are deployed. What we're really doing here is we're putting write cache on that VDI workstation, all right? I, I need to back up for one second. I realized I forgot something. So normally, when you boot up a virtual desktop, use provisioning server. Everyone familiar with the concept of provisioning server? Well, I'm going to tell you. OK, let's do a review. Thank you. Let's do a review. Provisioning server. I take a disk, a single disk, an operating system, right? I install Windows 7 on it. I install some applications on it. I do what I want to do. I make it my base image. And then I take that disk, and I'm basically going to convert it to a V-disk that sits on my provisioning server, okay, a virtual disk. Now I'm going to take that same disk that's sitting on my provision. I'm going to boot it a 1,000 times because I'm going to run 1,000 VMs off of this one disk, which is awesome for me as the administrator because I'm only managing one disk. And I've now deployed it a thousand times, and there's a thousand people using one disk. So when it's time for me to do my Windows update, I only got to do it one time, right? I've done it for a thousand users. So what happens is the provisioning server takes that disk and it streams it across the network to the VMs on the hypervisor, right? That's what's going on. It's streaming it across the network. It basically loads that disk into memory on the provisioning server and streams it out from there. Now during that time, I have to have a place for my page file, right? Because there's changes going on. When I'm the user, I'm logged in, I'm doing things, I have a page file. I have temporary rights. I have temporary files. So there are changes being made to my master disk, right? I don't want them to change my master disk. The reason I built this master disk is because this is what I want them to have. So when they reboot, when they reboot that VM, anything that got changed is wiped out. And the next time they log in, the next time it boot, I give them the same image I gave them the first time. So during that time, while they're using the VM, those changes, the write cache, the page file, right, is really, that's what we're talking about that needs to be written to the disk, right? That's why we need to make it fast. That's why it slows down. That's why IOPS become important, right? Because now I'm writing that to storage, right? I'm writing it to storage, a SAN, a micropod local, a flash cache, right? So that's my whole reason for wanting to make the IOPS faster is because my write cache needs to operate quickly. Right. So coming back to the micropod, that's what we're doing. We're running our workloads. We're streaming in the OS, right? And then we have our write cache on the local disk with enough IOPS for the users to do what they need to do. OK? So we have flash cache or SSD storage arrays. We have micropods. That's another way to allow for more IOPS for the VDI sessions. And I kind of like this one because you get the uh, user density, right? I know for sure. Hey, I know what workload I have to run, right? I can get 100, 100 virtual desktops on this one you bought. I pop it in, 100 users. I need another 100 users, pop in another one. I need another 100 users, pop in another one. So it's pretty consistent, right? 
All right, and so the third method to address the IOPS, or provide more IOPS, is software-based. And Atlantis Elio, what they do is something that's similar to, like, basically some VMs, some Linux VMs you import. I'm sorry, do you have a question? Okay. Oh. Okay. So basically what you want to do is click on OK right here. And okay, so the Atlantis Helio, what, they, what they've done is they've developed software to address the IAPS by importing some Linux VMs, basically, into your hypervisor and taking the memory that's in that hypervisor and turning it into storage, the data store, right? Because everything from the perspective of the hypervisor is a data store, right? My storage is a data store that I see, and then whatever connection I have, iSCSI, SCSI, fiber, NFS, right? So I'm basically connecting across the network somehow to get to my storage, right? Sometimes the network becomes the bottleneck, iSCSI or NFS, and even traditional SCSI-based storage. And that can become the bottleneck. So what they've done is they've taken software, and they've taken the memory of the host, and they present it to the host as a data store. So the data store is all just running in the memory of the host. So it's like, a million IOPS. It's like crazy fast. Okay, maybe not a million. I don't know exactly how many, but it's really fast because it's running in local memory. It's running in memory as instead of uh, going back to storage for anything. So, is it free? No, it's not free. Yeah, that would be really awesome. Yeah, this is technology by no company called Atlantis, but relatively new. They've been, I don't know, seven, eight years. But basically, running the VM and RAM, you know. So. Yeah, heard of that before. Yeah. So yeah, they, they 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 do all the big companies, all the financial chase, and but they they really dialed in. They cut their teeth in the uh, financial industry where they needed to have those IOPS available because people are doing massive work. So now they're starting to bring it out and you know picking resellers to kind of get into it. You know, we deployed it. I deployed it uh, last weekend, deployed it, moved some VM workloads into it, did some testing against our Whiptail, and uh, it's really nice. It's just a different way to do it. Different way to do the same thing we're trying to do, which is provide more IA. All right, so that is the end of my presentation. VDI best practices. Don't like the word best practices, but this is what we've learned over the time that we've been doing uh, VDI deployments. And just wanted to share those with everybody. If there's any questions. So we wanted to keep the place friendly for you and feel free to have a discussion. So people, uh, your experience, people actually save money by moving from you know, five hundred dollar desktop to VDI. <laughs> no. So the question is, do you save money by going to VDI desktops instead of traditional desktops? And in my experience has been, the answer is no. It typically costs more to provide a VDI desktop than it does to provide a traditional desktop. Although with that said, it is coming down, right? It's been like, uh, in the beginning, it was close to $2,000 per virtual desktop, right? And I've seen it come down to $1,200. I think the cheapest one I've seen is about $900 per virtual desktop. So the price is coming down as as the technology matures, the price is coming down with it. But not just for the technology, but you get the benefits of the management and the... Yeah, I'm not talking soft costs, right. I'm not talking soft costs. I'm just talking straight hard costs across the board. It costs more. Straight hard costs. You can make an argument on the soft costs with the single disk administration, and now I can get to it from anywhere, and, you know, that kind of stuff. Yes, sir. Um, my yeah, so yeah, that would be a soft cost, right? So you could put that together as far as the administration and travel time, and yes, yeah, so if you factor that in, it could come out to be cheaper than managing a physical desktop. Absolutely.
That's a great question, and it's going both ways. Some people are preserving their investment of the desktop that they have on the floor, and they're basically turning them into thin clients, basically locking them down. And some people are, and when they come to the end of life, they're replacing them with thin clients. Some of them are. Some of them are as much as a PC itself, depending on which type of thin client that you're going to get with the processing power in it. Um, for the thin client side, you know, with HDX, they basically offload a lot of the processing on the back end to the endpoint device. Have you heard about that? They basically, um, you know, you've heard of HDX, right? And basically what it does is I'm watching a <laughs> YouTube video. They're, I'm in the data center. I'm connected to a virtual desktop, right? And in that virtual desktop, I'm going to launch YouTube. I'm going to launch a video. So what happens is I have to decompress that code, this nice small code, and it's basically decompressing it in the data center, and it's sending it to me over the network. So that video comes across to me all choppy, and watching YouTube is not a pleasant experience through a virtual desktop, right? Because it decompressed it, and now it's large amounts of bandwidth that's getting shot down to my endpoint device. So the HDX technologies and some of the thin clients, what they do is they have it built into the chip. Is if it's capable of running that video, it'll send it in the native format, not decompress it on the virtual desktop. It'll send it in its native format down to the endpoint device and decompress it there and run it locally so it's smooth and it's not choppy. I'm not decompressing it at the other end. That's why some of the uh, thin clients, some of the real high-end thin clients are AutoCAD. I mean, literally, it's a thin client, but you can do full AutoCAD work on it. It's pretty amazing because of that technology, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Just for instance, I want to know what product will work well with Citrix. Citrix.com forward slash Citrix ready. They have the vendors that they have worked with that have these chips technology. Okay. So uh, for the vendors that work with Citrix or Citrix Ready, you can go to citrix.com slash ready, and it'll show you who has that type of technology ready to go. Forward slash Citrix Ready. Thank you. Uh, Microsoft licensing, how does that uh, work? Really? <laughs> how does Microsoft licensing work? Thanks, Ashes. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad you guys have another hour because. I <laughs> yeah. So uh, you should talk to your TRM. No, but basically the way that the Microsoft licensing works, if you have an enterprise license, it works one way, right? And if you don't have an enterprise license, it works another way. And depending on what type of thin client or endpoint devices you're going to use, it works another way. And I would tell you those three ways, except they seem to change every six months. So if you talk to your TRM, which is Jay, he, ha he has the latest information. I really depend on those guys to keep the licensing straight. Uh, being able to put the ZenApp server as a virtual server and then host on, on, on the hypervisor to have more density when you have a, a task-based user that's using, you can leverage ZenApp for that. For that. Okay, so you're talking about ZenApp desktops, using the traditional ZenApp desktop, published desktop. Not as a, necessarily just a published desktop, even a published app, but being able to host uh, ZenApp virtual machines, like I don't know how many you can put in a host, but each one is hosting 20 to 40 then have sessions, and then you put, if you can put 10 of them, then you're going to have 200, you can have over 200 sessions on one host to achieve higher density. Got it. I know what you're trying to say. Okay. So we have a hypervisor, right? And our hypervisor, we try to get as many VMs running on there as we can. That's the goal. We want to take best advantage of the hardware. So I can get 80, 100, 150 VMs on one hypervisor. So all that processing in that VDI is taking place on the hypervisor, right? So if I have really CPU-intensive or memory-intensive applications in that virtual desktop, then I can get less virtual desktops per host, right? 
So what Keith is talking about is you can move some of that workload to traditional Zen app. You know, Zen app comes with Zen Desktop, part of it. I don't even call it Zen app anymore. But uh, basically, what you can do is you can install applications on Zen app. You can run those applications, and remember, now that processing and memory utilization is happening on the Zen app workload, not the VDI workload, so you can get more VDI sessions per host uh, by uploading some of those applications that are intense over to the Zen app. So that is something that you cannot do, for example, with the VMware VDI, because they don't really have the Zen app technology. That is true. VMware does not have Zen app technology. <laughs> Um, yes, it is similar. But of course, it's not, it doesn't have not in the, not in the sure. Sure. Right. Yeah. It's like one thing at a time, which is what you want. The bang-up just got back from the other world. Did you hear about that? I did hear about that. Okay. Yep. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Are we still webinar and can I turn this thing off now? We're good? Um, we're still, we still have another uh, 14, 14 minutes. Okay. What is that, a question? Okay, no problem. It's the only reason why I'm going to be careful what I'm saying right now. <laughs> The benefits of Zen Desktop 7 so far? Well, we've only deployed it in a few lab test case scenarios. We haven't gone into production with it. We just started our first uh, production rollout at a private school in LA. That's our first one we're doing right now. Um, the install, the install of what we've seen is the difference so far. It's a single console that manages both the uh, desktop and Zen app. So you can manage everything in a single console now. And even like deploying, uh, even the deployment of Zen app or VDI is from the same console. Because you can use machine creation services to deploy Zen app now. Kind of. I haven't done it yet, but I've seen that I can do it in the console. Yeah. And that's true. And it seems like every release that claim comes out that the ICA protocol is now more efficient, uses less utilization, and works over higher latency. But I haven't tested either. Again, we haven't done any major. Nobody would go to the bleeding edge, you know, in a production at this point. Except the school, they want us to go full end. We told them it's our first ones and desktop seven production. They're like, yeah, we want to do it, so we're doing it. Yes, sir. Can you give a high level pitch on? Provisioning server and MCS. I've heard about them. I know they're involved in VDI, but I don't know why. Why the Citrix has two of them, and you know, what's the pros and cons of each one? Okay, that's a whole that's a whole lunch and learn. But I'll give you the synapses. Okay. okay. So there are two ways to deploy virtual desktops in Zen Desktop. There's a way. One's called Machine Creation Services. And if you're familiar with VMware Vue, uh, it's a linked clone, basically. What I have is I have a master image. I create that same master image, right? And from that master image, I basically just create a clone of that master image and deploy it a thousand times, right? Uh, I don't need another server. It's not streaming over the network, right? I'm not because provisioning server. I'm streaming that disk over the network. On machine creation services, I'm not. I'm not streaming over the network. Um, it's actually easier to set up. It's easy to set up. It's just a couple clicks. It's what comes native in Zen Desktop 7, and you can do it natively in 5.6 as well, right? You can just deploy it with MCS. Um, let's see. So the disadvantages of it. There's more disadvantages to MCS than PBS, but I'll just give you a couple. Is like doing a storage v motion on MCS is not officially supported by Citrix, and I've seen it fail. If I want to move my my uh, workstations, my VDI workstations from one data store to another data store, it's not officially supported. And sometimes it just fails. It just 
says, I can't do this. Because of the way that there's an identity disk associated with it, and if you're using a personal V disk that's associated with it, and the way it ties it together. So I would say MCS is best used in a small deployment scenario, a couple hundred, maybe 300 desktops, and you don't plan on moving things around a lot. But in an enterprise where you're using you know, a lot of desktops, you want to use provisioning server because you can be motion in that right cache is right. So when you tune your storage, it's all right. And we're talking about the IOPS, and all those IOPS are really right. So there's a few reads, but it's mostly right. With MCS, it's reads and writes to the storage consistently back and forth, reads and writes, reads and writes. So the provisioning server uh, is more mature, is more mature technology, and it has less problems. We don't get as many calls to our support desk. That, you said that was less space, right? Provisioning server takes less space. Provisioning server takes less space. That's the one you're actually cloning the image from. That is correct. But you also have to make sure that you have a more robust network with you do have to have a more robust bus network for a provisioning server when you're streaming the OS, absolutely. That was a great question. And the question is, how many VMs can you have per data store? And the answer is, it depends on your storage vendor, and it depends on the hypervisor that you're using, and depends on if you're MCS or PVS. So there's really three variables there, right? And this is why I, yeah, <laughs> this is why I've become a big fan of NFS. Because NFS, I don't have that restriction. Remember, VMware used to tell us you can only run 12 to 15 servers per LUN, right? Remember that? 12 to 15 servers per LUN. And then they, two VM worlds ago, they said, no, nope, you can run as many servers as you want per LUN, right? And depending on if you have iSCSI or SCSI or Fiber Channel, right? Um, and then NFS, there's no theoretical limit whatsoever. There's how much bandwidth do you have going to that data store. So the last check in the official best practice, the best practice guide, if you're running iSCSI or Fiber Channel, it's 20 to 25 VMs per LUN. That's the official stance of the best practice guys that Citrix has out right now, is 20 to 25 VMs per LUN. With iSCSI or SCSI, yeah, or fiber, fiber channel. Yep. Yeah, it's a limitation of the SCSI protocol, basically, is why they do that, right? It's a limitation of the SCSI protocol. That's why we don't want to break it up because they don't want to overload the host and how many connections uh, back to the data store. Yes, sir. Pros or cons using Windows XP or Windows 7? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. XP to Windows 7. Um, Jonathan, you got any insight on that? Also, there's going to be a change, and what that change is going to be from XP to 7 is like profile, user profiles, and some of the policies to redirect some things. But, it's, but the overall, they're about the same overall performance-wise, other than what Jonathan just mentioned. But you will have to address your profiles differently on 7 and XP. Any more questions? Jim just wants to know when we're going fishing. <laughs> when we're going fishing. Yes. By the way, you need to come to the last one. Healthcare. UCSC healthcare. 
Uh, Mike just caught a bunch of yellowtail on Friday. Okay, all right. And we have, uh, we, we have California State Hospitals, you know, four, four people here. Five State Hospital, you know, Annette Olivia here, and then Quan, and there's two colleagues over there um, from Sacramento. So we have a lot of healthcare representation here, and financial. We have Simitar, they do software for credit unions, and of course, FIS, software for banks all over the world. What kind of competitors are those banks? <laughs> really? Well, that's why we have one different side of the room. Well, that's why. Got it. <laughs> well, that's why best practice is different for you than it is for you. So next week, we're going to have a security focus seminar. You guys can, uh, the brothers from Sacramento, you can join us on the webinar. You're welcome. Um, it will be, we're going to have, uh, we have a security uh, partner, a company called Sentex Global. They do a lot for DOD and bringing all those best practices to commercial. So they're going to have people, uh, most probably their CTOs, going to talk what's new from DEF CON and Black Hat. You know, what's the latest, you know, um, on security. So, so that's next week. So we have those seminars every week, 12 to 1. Thank you so much for joining us. Feel free to join us. It's usually informal. Just a technology update on all the technology. So thank you so much for coming. I want to thank in a special way the students that we have in the Citrix class for allowing us to invade your space today. You know, today. So thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Yeah, all right.